church the presence of the Lord is here do you feel him do you feel him? the presence of the Lord is here online family lives are being changed this morning the power of God is going to be felt this morning and I believe you're going to be a part of it let's lift our hands all across this sanctuary church come on come on Lord Father God we adore you we're here today gathered to celebrate you to celebrate the victory you share with us to celebrate your salvation your peace everything that comes with you Lord we love you we believe there's nothing you cannot do because you are all powerful Holy Spirit lead this service today in Jesus name let the church say hallelujah 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 surrounds me just one word the darkness has to retreat thank you Lord just one touch I feel the presence of heaven just one touch my eyes were open to see my 
heart can't help but believe There's nothing that a God can do There's not a mountain that He can move Oh, praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that a God can do Come on, church, let's sing it out. One word. Just one word. You could be so Thank you, Lord. Just one word. And you revive. Thank you, Lord. It's just one touch. Just one touch. I feel the power. I feel the power of heaven. Just one touch. Just one touch. My eyes. My eyes were open. Just sing it out. There's nothing. There's nothing that a God can do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Don't praise the name. Don't oh, praise the name. That makes me so great. There's nothing. There's nothing that a God can do. Oh, there's nothing. There's nothing that a God can do. There's not a prison wall. There's not a prison wall. He can break through. We wanna praise the name. Oh, praise the name. too hard for our God. Hallelujah. Sing this out with me. I will. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power. There's nothing that a God can do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, we'll praise His name. Oh, praise that makes a way. There's nothing that a God can do. Oh, there's nothing. There's nothing that a God can do. There's not a prison wall. There's not a prison wall He can break through. Hallelujah to your Jesus. Oh, praise the name. Call you 
what you're doing in this house. Lift up your hands, church, and give him worship. Sing it out. 
on, church. You sound beautiful. Sing it. Sing holy. Yes, God. Sing holy.
God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. I hear the chains hit the ground. Hey, God of revival, pour it out. the 
some brand new developments that are right across the street. We call forth the families. We call forth the mamas. We call yes. forth the babies. We prophesy the families are returning to a place a prayer that marriages will be saved because you chose a people that refused to compromise. We refuse to shut our doors. We refuse to be silent. We open up our mouth and we prophesy to the land across the street. We do declare there is a new sanctuary. We do declare city of destiny is built. Oh, come on, open up your mouth. This is the part where you and I prophesy and we prophesy revival all over Apopka. We prophesy revival to Orlando, Florida. We prophesy revival all over Florida, all over the United States. God, we thank you that America will have a great awakening. Oh, pray in the spirit right now. You online, begin to pray over your children. Pray over your families. Pray over your marriages. We thank you, Lord, from the White House to the crack house. Salvation, salvation, deliverance, hope, Joy, revival, in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. And God, we thank you, Lord. God, when praises go up, heaven comes down. And we're in desperate need of heaven. God, we can't do life as usual. I refuse to come into a service and not be touched by the presence of Almighty God. I thank you because of your presence. You do a deep work on the inside of each of us, Lord. You fill us up, Lord, for every family represented here, for every person that might be empty, running on low. I speak faith, faith, hope, joy. The joy of the Lord is their strength. We prophesy joy. We prophesy joy. Every battle that's been fighting you, your destiny, we prophesy to you online that the joy of the Lord gives you the strength to persevere. May the perseverance of God through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God be your testimony this morning. God, and we declare as we testify that all the people, as we exalt you, will see your works and glorify you in Jesus' name. We can sing that for another hour. God of revival. He's reviving you and I. God bless you, Story Life. God bless you on our online church. It's a great day to be alive. It's a great day to be alive, church. Never in my whole life, you may be seated in the presence of our God, have I been more excited to be alive in a season, in a moment. This is the moment, this is the hour for the church to be the church like never before. Are you working on your top five? Pastor Brad gave us a mandate. He gave us a mandate. God, the Bible gave us a mandate. And so I encourage you, do your top five everywhere you go. Be yielded to the Holy Spirit to pray for someone, to love on someone, to get them to church. And sometimes it's just that seed. God's been watering and watering and watering that seed. And then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit does the work and they show up. God is good. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. I want to give honor where honor is due. I have to have my beautiful redheaded mama stand up. Stand up, Livia. Thank y'all for loving on my mama. She gets in that prayer closet and she fights for us. I'm glad I got a praying mama. So much of my prayer life is a result of that woman's faithfulness. Of course, y'all know Pastor Ryan and I were related. That's his mama too. She's got six children, all these grandbabies. We're blessed. We're all the mamas in the house. We thank God for you, but I got to give honor where because she doesn't get to come in that often, y'all. Amen. And then we got the mama, the, ma the matriarch, the pioneer. We've got, I'm so glad Abra's in the house to preach the word. Abra's in the house. It's been great having you home. Brad and I talked about it this morning. It's been great having her home. So this is the third Sunday 
She's bringing the word and it stirs my spirit because for such a time as this, what's on her life, y'all get ready, get ready, get ready. I am just so excited. It's about to fully take fruition. Got it. The next six months, the Lord spoke to me about the next six, six months. We went on a fast. As we ended June, we did a fast for story life. And I know that some prophetic things have happened. God's given Pastor Brad a miracle. So thank y'all for praying for Pastor Brad. God is doing it in his life. So you'll see him very soon. He went through a procedure and he's getting his strength back in Jesus name. Uh, where are all our youth at? Our youth. I heard maybe Pastor Scott. Are you doing the youth today? Hey, let's thank God for Pastor Scott, Pastor Tamron, for the Foley's. Y'all, they've been pillars in the house for years, and they continue to serve and pour out. So if you are a young person, 18 to 12, just stand up. This is your time to be released. We are pronouncing blessing. Pastor Scott has a word from heaven, so you can be released right now. We got a few announcements. Next Friday, we have our Story Life Men, and if you are a man and you need some encouragement, they're going to meet at Pastor Ryan's house. You can text us or you can get the church app who has downloaded our app anyone you can get it it should be right here church center you can hold up your phone right here scan it screen it download it and on the app has all of our announcements has everything that's going on there's a place for you at story life the last announcement that i want to say is mark your calendars july 21st we are doing another worship and prophetic prayer night okay so get the word out we're getting things moving here god is doing big things and i also want to say this morning Y'all don't forget to pray for Minister John. Can y'all commit to pray for Minister John this week? Last night, Mom, Brad and I went into prayer and we hit heavy on some things and we covered him strong. And so this is my challenge to you all week long. Will y'all commit to one thing that you can fast for Minister John and cover his life? Because he is a pillar in the house. And although he couldn't be here today, he gets to be here when he's home. So we're going to cover him this week, okay? All right, I love you guys. Let's get ready for the word and our time of giving. morning family you doing good today it's a good day amen we're excited to have everyone and we're if you're online just text out five people tell them to join us it's going to be a great day I really feel there's going to be an impartation today I feel God is going to move mightily there's some things that are whew, I'm carrying deep in my spirit that I think the Lord will release today and um, so some things you don't really get to teach you just impart. So that means there has to be open vessels, hungry vessels, hearts that are receptive. God wants to move mightily in your life. And God wants to move mightily in this nation, in this world. As we ended last week, um, there was a prophetic word that there's a five-year window of a global harvest coming forth. There's always harvest, but I think we're on the threshold of something really where we'll see nations born in a day. And I believe that you're a part of that. The body of Christ is so significant in this hour. So just before we get into the word, and um, I'm enjoying my time with the Lord, enjoying this time. So thank you, Pastor Rachel. Getting ready to go on the road with John and, and a lot of other things. We're doing uh, several church tours and different things. So we'll both be out. I'll be preaching the gospel. He'll be singing, Don't Stop Believing. And sometimes we get to do it together. So we are out and we come back in September. So keep us in prayer. Amen. And we're moving mightily, seeing God do great things. I want to just give God some praise and a testimony. We're going to receive his tithe and our offering. Tithe is really mandatory. It's the base. Um, you know, I know that, that Brad's perspective is don't get in a religious mindset of just 10%. And I understand that because if God asks for it all, we give it all. But that's kind of like the, the base. It's the first tenth. It belongs to God. It's holy. It redeems what is rest. Sacrifice is so important. It's so big. Um, I mean, all throughout the word, there's nowhere you can get away from giving. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But I think we're in this real prophetic moment right now. And that there are, um, while economies around the world are, are up and down and all around, I mean, they say China just surpassed America. 
you know, who knows where everything's going economically. We know one, one day where it's going to go. <laughs> They'll be begging for food and begging for bread, but not God's people. There is a supernatural supply. And when I mean that, it's not just like things happen. It's, it's you've been a consistent, faithful steward all this time. You've gotten on God's economy instead of the world's economy. And that's vitally important. There's a lot of peace with that. And Amy, I want to testify, we were talking about this because we're talking about every industry is impacted right now, whether it's real estate or whether it's medical or whether it's financial, it doesn't matter. I mean, the economy is economy right now, amen? And it's impacted. And, and we're people that are in this world that we're not of this world. And I'm saying that to you because this is one of the areas that you really have to, I, I say, something clicks in you when you really give this part over that you're, it's not even your money. It's God's money. It's just your steward of it all. So that, that happened for me when I was about 19 years old. I got saved when I was 18, 19 years old. I made a covenant with God when I heard JC Penney's story that he gave 90% and lived on 10%. And I covenanted with God that I do three things. So I've seen God's supernatural provision, but recently about a month or so, two months ago, whenever it was, I stood in this pulpit, I said, there's like a fresh activation that I felt something like where there's times that God always supplies our needs, right? But then there's times of just like, let me show you what miracles look like. Let me show you what walking this realm looks like. And I testified and something got unleashed and, and released in my life. We were doing my Faith Matters tour. We were up at... Uh, Pastor Jonathan Shuttlesworth Church, and um, and the Lord spoke to me to give a thousand dollars to this minister, and it, it was just burning in me. And it, it, honestly, a thousand dollars just it's it's not the amount. It wasn't like God was asking me for a million dollars. It wasn't like He was asking me for a hundred thousand dollars. Is a thousand dollars? It was within my capacity, and it wasn't going to take away food or a dress or anything else. Amen. So, but I moved quickly on that. This is important. I moved quickly on that. And I did it like that. And the, the pastor that the Lord spoke to me was going backstage. I went, nobody could see anything. And then I told you the testimony. A pastor's wife came and put a watch on me. I didn't even know what it was. It was a Cartier watch. I mean, a very nice watch. And then I turned around and started prophesying. And I prophesied to this pastor and I, I said, I see two things coming into your life. A great harvest of souls that you're leaving, leading a movement and a great harvest of finances that you're leading a people into God's provision. Because that's a, that's a, there's an anointing. There are people that are anointed to bring financial deliverance. There's an anointing on my life to bring financial deliverance to people. It's just, it's been there for decades. And so I saw this. He texts me later about a couple days. He said something to the, like the prophetic word that you gave to me in the parking lot came to pass in 20 minutes. A person wrote a million dollar check to him, million dollar check. Don't hate, get excited. Man, I was like, that is huge. That's huge. So I'm going about my business and, um, this is a word the Lord gave me for today, but I want you to hear, I'm about to give a testimony. So Isaiah chapter 45 says this in verse two, I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut asunder the bars of iron. And I will give you treasures. That means storehouses. It means money. It means treasure. That's the etymology of darkness. I'll give you money in obscurity. I'll give you money in odd places is what he's saying. Like there's some obvious places that money should flow from your life. And there's some places that are hidden, some dark places, obscurity. They can't even be seen. And God says, I have supply for you in places that are obscure from you. They're not even in your purview. It's not like you can even see it. Are you with me? Because I'm, I'm speaking a word that's about to bring some financial deliverance over someone. Hear the word of the Lord. And, and hidden riches of secret places. And thou mayest know that I am the Lord which call thee by name and am the God of Israel. So God says, not only am I going to raise up and subdue nations, and he's given this prophetic word about Cyrus, but he says, I'm going to give you hidden treasures in place of darkness. 
So this happened and it was all activated. I'm sitting there thinking, I said, how can I testify this? It was all around this, this gift that felt kind of normal to me, but it, have you ever had the Holy Spirit just hit you and be like, you've got to do this now, now. And it was like a now thing and, and they're worshiping and I just ch -ch 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 and, and moved on it very fast. Well, right after that, I was invited to speak and it was a bunch of seminars taking place, like a, a bunch of different breakout sessions. And Amy, it was, you know, I've got to tell you in the natural, it was kind of hard for me because there were maybe about a thousand people there. And in, in my breakout session, there was four people. Most people had like at least 40 or 100. There's four people, right? So in the natural and in like they didn't even, I'm just being petty right now, right? There was no microphone. There was no thing set up and everybody else had all their stuff set up. And, you know, I just felt like the redhead stepchild for a minute, right? And I'm like, wow, because I do think I carry something. I think my voice is valuable, guys. And so, so I'm like, all right. And I, I was good. I, I, I did what I did as if a million people were there. If 10,000 people were there, I delivered in the same capacity, the same anointing, the same way. So that passes. About two weeks ago, there was a person that was in there that the Holy Spirit spoke to because I'm helping a few other organizations. So I'm working with about three to four different nonprofit organizations. And the Holy Spirit spoke to this person and told him to give 500,000, half a million dollars to this organization. That's pretty exciting. Because it really, so, so I was all excited, etc. And I was like, wow, look at God. Well, yesterday was Asher's birthday. And um, today's Neil's birthday. Happy birthday, Neil. And it's Asher's birthday yesterday. So I was over um, watching him ride a donkey and a pony and stuff. And my phone rings and I wouldn't usually answer it at a birthday party, but I decided to answer it. And I pick it up and they said, great news. I said, yeah. Now, the importance of that is I knew I'd be preaching today. So I was in prayer that morning and I was studying that morning. And all of a sudden I started calling forth a million dollars for three different organizations that I believe God wants to really bless three different ministries that I believe the Lord really wanted to bless. Now that sounds co so crazy. So I'm sitting there at Asher's birthday and I pick up the phone and, and they said, great news. I said, what's that? They said, we just got a phone call out of the blue. And I said, yeah. They said, uh, they said, did you get it? And I, I said, what, what did you get? What they asked this person calling me, did you get it? And she said, what are you talking about? They said, oh, Goldman Sachs. She goes, oh, yeah, Goldman Sachs had called. I didn't recognize it, though. So they called. In that day, they gave 500000 and another person gave 500000 One million dollars came in yesterday to an entity that we're closely related to that we help support. Oh, you aren't hearing me. Now, here's the crazy thing out of it came out of a room with four people in it. Four people in it. Four people. You see, God, I, I, I was kind of, it happened and I was like, oh, praise the Lord. And it wasn't until last night that I called Pastor Brad and Rachel and I was testifying. I was like, there's never been a million dollar gift giving to this entity and a million dollars just came in. You aren't hearing what I'm saying. Would you get excited, story life, that a million dollars just came in? So what I'm telling you, and I'm telling you kind of, I'm dancing around it without telling all the details, is that we're in a time that God has already gone before you. And there is such supernatural provision for your assignment. 
and your purpose and what you carry. And you've got to stop looking at lack in the name of Jesus and what's not happened and what's happened for someone else. And you've got to just start prophesying and believing and knowing. And I started thinking like a thousand dollars was such a small seed to me. I'll be honest, but God doesn't care about the amount. It's not the amount. It's your obedience. If God tells you to give $12 and 99 cents, do it and do it quickly. If God tells you to give 1200, you do it and you do it quickly. And God, God is moving because God wants to know who can hear my voice and follow an instruction because God is leading his people into supernatural provision. You better hear I'm speaking prophetically and I'm speaking, I'm speaking reality for you because there's some of those that will miss it because you think it's just another time, another word, but God's preparing storehouses right now. He's preparing storehouses. He's preparing people who will be able to be great stewards like the tribe of Issachar to be able to tell the body of Christ what to do and how to do it. You'll be a storehouse for what is ahead and get yourself in a position that you can move mightily in the area of provision for the people of God. When I say the people of God, I'm not just talking about Christians, though it's important to take care of your own household. God's going to raise up Christians to be in very strategic places for what is ahead of us. Get ready for the greatest harvest. Get ready for the greatest supply. And I'll tell you something I've learned. And Oral Roberts said this, and, and, and he said, that provision is always connected to souls. It is. It's always connected to the heart of God and the heart of God is always for the lost. It's always for people. It's always for people. Spirit of the living God, let us not miss a moment. Speak what we're to give. We know the tithe belongs to you, but I feel in my heart there's some people that you want to break past some barriers. There's some people that you want to increase their business that it looks insane. It was insane for a million dollars to come out of four people. The offering should have been $40. <laughs> that would be the average. But God, you do the extraordinary. You do the impossible. You do the unexpected. And God, I, I pray that you would just increase faith. This is not far away. This isn't somebody I'm hearing about. This happened to us. So God, I thank you for miracle after miracle after miracle. Breakthrough in business, breakthrough in favor, breakthrough in provision, breakthrough in every way. And let us recognize it's for your kingdom, for your assignment, for your purpose. Now, thank you that you speak with clarity in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. I'm telling you, there's quick returns coming. Amy, there's quick returns coming. Unexpected places of what the Lord's speaking to me. And God's still the same God he was yesterday. He's the same God that blessed you in 1990. He's the same God that blessed you in 2010. He's the same God that carried you through 2020. He's the same God. He doesn't fail. He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. That's your mini sermon before the rest. Come on and get your tithe. Get his offering. Make your checks table to Story Life Church. Let's bring it up. Thank you for all my online givers. Uh, you can give by Cash App, Venmo. It's all right there. You can go to Story Life Church. You can give on the app. Thank you for being a generous little giver. You can give by credit card. Don't get in debt that way but everybody gets something. If a dollar is your best, bring it up to the altar. Get something and bring God, bring God his very best. Bring God the very best. I believe that God's getting ready to do something and it's connected to the harvest. It's connected to what God is moving. That there's great provision for every assignment, for the purpose that you carry as a people. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank God for you. Everybody stand up. Let's grab the person's hand around you. Um, I don't think I can teach this as much as I can impart this, but stretch across the aisles. You already know that's a miracle that you're holding. I want you to grab that person's hand. Just squeeze it. I love for you to feel what a tangible, living, breathing miracle feels like. Because had the enemy had his way, he would have wiped that person out. But the devil is a liar. I mean, if you only really understood their story, if you knew the hell they had to go through, if you understood that the hand that you hold is a person that didn't want to live one day or, or, or came out of a generational curse or went through abuse or abandonment and the enemy would just have them completely messed up. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But God has a plan for you. Squeeze that hand. God has a plan. And you're needed. Look at somebody say, you're needed. Now, I want you to pray over that person because one of the greatest ways that healing came to me was to get outside of myself. 
When I started going into the inner city and winning little boys and girls to the Lord Jesus Christ, I began to get healed. The, the brokenness on the inside of me, the greatest way that you get your deliverance is to bring other people through deliverance. The greatest way God starts rebuilding and, and doing a work in you and getting you out of that victim mentality and stuff is to begin to help others. Amen? So I want you to really pray that a holy boldness would come on them, that they would recognize that they're called and chosen by God, that they, today they would receive the heart of God and the, the compassion of God, that today God will stir them up for revival and for souls and for the lost. I just begin to weep and cry over there because a person that did a lot of hurt and a lot of damage in my life, I begin to weep and cry that they wouldn't go to hell. I started feeling compassion in an area that I haven't felt for a long time. I mean, and, and not for masses. I, I, I care about souls. But when you've been, when people say this person was a monster in your life, they were absolutely abusive and caused so much pain and torment and trauma to you. And yet, I don't even know the condition of their soul now. And I begin to weep under the power of God because I cannot imagine anyone going and spending eternity in hell and I begin to think about people that I know who are around me where where do they stand with the Lord Jesus Christ where are they even in the natural I want you to begin to think about your top five right now I want you to feel what God feels I want you to pray over that person and ask that the Holy Spirit would begin to impart that this would not just be another church service but this would be a moment this would be a move of God this would be a holy unction and anointing that the Holy Spirit set your heart on fire and you feel what he feels I remember the first time I led someone to the Lord I laid at a church all night long at the altar and I began to cry out that what God would give me his heart and when I got up I went to a diner and I looked at a woman in her eyes and I could see through her and I began to weep on the inside and I began to tell her about Jesus and tell her that there was another path that she didn't have to live in the desperation and the condition that she was in and I remember as a tear began to fall down her eye. And I remember leading her to the Lord. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know scripture. I didn't know how to pray it. But I remember God was with me. He was backing with me because God cares about the loss. And I pray right now that you would have a, a, a passion, a compassion for those. I pray right now that the Holy Spirit would just put his heart in you. The heart of God would just get in you. Pray over that person right now. Holy Spirit, do what you can do, not by my and not by power, but by your spirit, move radically, move revolutionary today. I ask that you would anoint me, that every word that comes out of my mouth would not be mine, but it would be yours. That every ear would be able to hear with clarity, do something so supernatural here today that we will never be the same. Let your fire, let your power touch us, transform us, change us. I thank you. Can one person make a difference? Let us stand between the dead and the living. Let us go out of here different than what we came. Let us go out of here full of your love, full of your mercy, full of your wisdom. In Jesus' mighty name. Now pray for that person for 30 seconds. Speak life. Speak a holy boldness over them. Just ask them, say, what is it you need God to do? And pray over them right now. Now turn around, give them a big hug. Say, I love you. There's nothing you can do about it. Just let them know God has them. And you can be seated. I'm going to go quickly. I'm going to review some of what we did. I'm going to lay enough of a foundation that you scripturally can go there with me. But I, I believe the Holy Spirit just wants to do something. Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of righteous is a tree of life. And he who wins souls is what? Wise. How many of you want to be wise? He who wins souls is wise. Listen to me carefully. As a believer, there's a mandate on your life to win people to the Lord. Sheep beget sheep. Shepherds lead sheep. Now, shepherd is a sheep too and has the responsibility as a believer to lead people to the Lord. I believe so much of Christianity and so much of what we call church, we have lost the main thing. The main thing is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news is that God so loved you that he sent his only begotten son into a sinful world that had no hope and no way for redemption. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. His name is Jesus. It's not Confucius. It's not Muhammad. It's not Allah. It's not Buddha. It's not New Age. 
It's not anything else that you want to put on it. There's only one truth, and that is Jesus Christ. He is the truth. He is the way. He is the life. He conquered death, hell, and the grave so that when he got up, you could get up. He redeemed us to a holy God who could not partake with sin because we were all sinners. And thank God for his grace and his mercy, for his love and his goodness. And he commissioned us. The first thing that Jesus did when he implemented the church was he put the fivefold ministry gift in place. And he, he released the church and the power and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he told us to go ye into all the world and to preach the gospel and disciple men and, and change nations. It is the cornerstone of our calling. Look at somebody say, you have a calling. You have a calling. So when people try to make it so difficult, what is it that I'm supposed to do? How am I supposed to do it? We're missing the main thing. What you're supposed to do is win people to the Lord. And I pray today there'll be a deep conviction that, that rests on the inside of you that you'll never, ever be the same. Can one person make a difference? I remember when we had five people in a storefront church and God had called us. We'd gone to Tampa and the Lord had told us to go to Tampa. And they gassed a man with gasoline because of the color of his skin. And nobody would go into this area called College Hill and Ponce de Leon. And the Lord began to speak to me. And I said to Randy, I said, I need to go in there. He said, Paula, ambulances don't even go in there without a police escort. I said, God told me to go in there. He said, well, if God's telling you, then you need to go. And so I went in and I know that when you meet a person, you got to meet them at their point of need. And here we are poor living in Dolphin Point apartments, had nothing ourselves. But I went to the Intamin Bakery and I said, sir, do you have any leftover stuff that you've got to discard? And I prayed for favor to be on my life. I prayed for God to be with me. And they said, yeah, we'll, we'll give you these. And I started taking intimate bakeries and donuts and stuff in. And I knock on the doors and I had a little tarp. We didn't have a truck at that time. And I'd say, I have some intimate bakery goods for you. I'd love for you to bring your children out. I, I just want to spend 30 minutes with them and, and talk to them and do some storytelling and play, play with them and do some games with them. And it was so simplistic. I had absolutely nothing. I didn't even have puppets to work with but God will always use you come on God has God doesn't need a lot he just needs your availability he just needs your heart your yes and so I went out and began to win people to the Lord and next thing I know our little storefront church grew from five to 50 to 100 we had to go to plant high school and we were in plant high school and we would go to Morrison's cafeteria and we'd have to roll out that piano and put out that rug every single week and do all the setup. And, you know, we're in a church cafeteria. The school alarm's going off all the time. You'd be preaching and be like, beep, beep. I mean, everything's going off. I mean, there, there's no convenience. There's nothing going right for you. Nobody knew where to enter. You couldn't put signs out or anything else. And we just kept going. But we would go out into the neighborhoods. And I went to Morrison's. Y'all remember Morrison's? I loved Morrison's, that buffet, right? All you can eat for $2.99. And so we, we still didn't have anything. We didn't get salaries. We didn't make anything. I'd, I'd clean whoever's toilet I could to just get a few bucks here and a few bucks there. And we're walking along. And, and um, there's this lady. I didn't know her name at the time, but her name's Kim. And she's serving behind. And we're serving, and, and we get our stuff. We check out, and we go and sit down. And the Holy Spirit speaks. And I said, Randy, I, I think we're supposed to give her $100. Now, $100 would have been like a million dollars to me at that time. And he said, I felt that too. And I said, well, you know, you look at your situation. How are we going to feed Brad and the kids this week if we give $100? Because we didn't know. So we went back and we gave her a $100 tip for literally giving us a tray and checking us out. Gave her a $100 tip because the Holy Spirit said to do so. She begins to weep and cry, Rosella. As she's weeping and crying tears, she said, I woke up this morning because it's my boy's birthday. And I said, God, if you are real, then bring me $100 to buy my boy a bike. She said, I've never been to church. She'd never been saved. She said, but she'd heard, you know, she hears about God. And Jesus said, if you're real, then send me $100. That's the way a sinner talks to God. That's the way that they relate to God. If you're real, show me this sign. And then God uses his two poor preachers to hand her $100. We lead her to the Lord. She starts coming and she becomes our number one evangelist, number one soul winner. She's in full-time ministry today. You see, winning 
a soul doesn't mean you have to be the most prolific preacher or know the word like Pastor Bragg or quote a hundred scriptures. It means that you're sensitive to God, that you care about what he cares about. So I want to take you through a few of the points so I could keep on going because everything in my life was built on the basis of a passion for those that are lost. I didn't want to preach the choir. If you go, did you ever make mistakes in ministry? Absolutely. You say, what are some of the mistakes you made? Christian TV blackballed me. I was, I was too radical, too pretty. They said I was too sexy. Don't take that. I didn't fit the part. I wore pants. As the first person on TBN to ever wear pants as a woman, for real, you, you would have thought like, I just sent a million people to hell. I mean, there, there were, it was too radical. Our church was, was, was very, for the 80s and the 90s, was revolutionary to have, to have black and white and Hispanic and millionaires and homeless people all in one building together. It says a time bomb, just that, that it would explode. I was like, it's going to explode all right with the power of God. And just everything they told me was wrong about me. My story, I'd, I'd been married too many times. and I didn't have the pedigree. I didn't grow up in church and all the things they told me I couldn't. So I was completely blackballed from all Christian television. And God had told me to go on TV. So there was a contract available on BET. And so I, I had no, I had $10,000, I can't say it, and it had taken me seven years to save that. And so I told them, go ahead, let me sign this contract. It obligated me to a million, about a million and a half dollars. Now you could, if you, <laughs> I always had, I thought, I was like, well, God, what if it doesn't succeed? There was like this 30-day buyout, but you weren't guaranteed for somebody else to get your time slot. So that was $23,000, like $23,500 on Tuesday mornings at 7.30 a.m. It was insane, or 7 a.m. I mean, it was it's just absolutely crazy. I said, let's, here, if you haven't noticed, I'm white. If you don't know what BET is, it's Black Entertainment Television. So I sign it, and they go, that's absurd. You're white, going on Black Entertainment Television with no money. And I had a rent-to-rent-to-own furniture, a black corn drop. I talked real Mississippi, real high. I can't even do it now. Hey, y'all. I, I, it was ridiculous. Y'all know my mom was going to, she named me Luann. Do y'all know that? My name was Luann. That, that's, this is for a real story. When, so my dad wasn't at the hospital when my mom had me, and she named me Luann. And my dad said, where's my daughter? He, knew I, and he looked and said, it's that one. And he saw Luann. He goes, oh, she ain't going to be named Luann. And my dad's name was Paul. And thank God he turned around and he said, call her Paula. And when my mom was knocked out, he changed my name. Thank God. Or I would have only had a ministry in Mississippi. Because I talk like this, my name would have been Luann. Luann. That would have been pretty pathetic. All right. So I'm sorry for all the Luanns. We love you. Amen. Paul is a little more global. My father was prophetic, at least in one moment, all right? And, and so here I was. I, I couldn't speak right. I couldn't do anything right. But I, I was obedient to do what God told me. I went on it, and, and Ebony Magazine wrote, you know things have changed when the most popular program is a white woman on a black network. They said everything is, is it was the highest rated. It, it went crazy. People would drive in and remember somebody driving in because it would cost so much. And we didn't even have a P.O. box. We didn't have a call center. We had nothing. You know, God will use your nothingness and bring a lot to you. It seems like the more I had right, the less it worked effective. The more I, I relied on the ways that man makes it happen, the less that it happened. And so what, what happened, Eli, is people start driving in and they said, here, the Lord woke me up and told me to find you and to come here because they didn't even know how to find me. And they said, the Lord told me to give you this. It'd be $10,000. The Lord told me to give you this. It'd be $20,000. Never, ever missed a payment. Never missed a payment. And so we just start buying up everything. Fox, CBS, I mean, you name it, ABC, NBC. We, we start buying airtime everywhere. And millions of people were hearing the gospel and getting saved. And once it became successful, 
then the Christian television stations wanted me on and they offered me daily programs. When I went on the Christian television stations, there's certain things that you have to do. Telethon and everything I did, I did out of purity, authenticity, and a true conviction. I never crossed the line of not being convicted about what I was preaching and what I was doing. But you kind of become a puppet to some of their ways and some of the, the, the ways that they make things happen. And when that happened, it's like I started preaching to the choir. You're not hearing it. It's like I just became a big part of the cesspool. Not saying it doesn't reach people, but saying most of the American church multiplies by division. It's not that we're actually winning the loss. It's that another church goes down and the members come over here. And so it's multiplying by division. And that is not how God added to his church daily. And I'm going to teach you how God added to his church daily. Because God adds to his church because you, the vessel of God, you, the chosen of God, have the passion of God, have a tongue of the learn that is anointed by God. God has anointed you. He's furnished you to go out into the world and to preach the gospel. Can I help you do that? Somebody say, help me, Pastor Paula. So, so there's so much that I want to give to you. But we know that the underlining strength of a true revival will be a passion for men's souls and the proclamation of a living word from God. You are a believer that is called to extend the kingdom of God. You are the one that brings cultural change. Amen? It's not so much changing a culture. You're creating a culture. And that culture that you're creating is what? The kingdom culture. Look at somebody. Say you're called. Slap somebody up the head. Say, give them a high five. Say, God wants you. Come on. Say, he wants to use you. So how do you bring cultural change? How do you change the world? Just like Jesus did. How do we do that? One person at a time. You build the family of God. So in John chapter 4, for the sake of time, you go read it. But it's the woman at the well. You know the story. We've read it all the way through. Verse 4, I must needs go through Samaria. He goes to the city called Sachar. Jacob's well was there. He sits on it the sixth hour. And there comes a woman, verse 7, to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me to drink, because his disciples had gone to buy meat. And the woman said of Samaria to him, how is it you being a Jew, ask to drink, Da, 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 da. Jesus said to her, if you knew the gift of God, who it was that said to thee, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given thee living water. The woman says, sir, you don't have anything to draw with. The well's deep. And uh, where, is your, where are you going to get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? And Jesus answered, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give to him will never thirst. But the water that I give to him will be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. That's so important because Jesus identifies himself with their thirst. And this is a key for you winning people to the Lord. So how does God do this? God reaches one person in order to reap a city. So when God wants to change a nation, he changes a person. When God wants to change a family, he changes a person. When God wants to change the world, he changes a person. He uses this woman that's had five husbands and now has a situation in order to reach the city. God's ways are not like man's ways. In every generation, God has a harvest that he seeks to reap through revival. And revival is different from evangelism. So can I help you for just a moment? Because evangelism is the preaching of the gospel to the lost that they might be saved. Not all of you will have the office of evangelist, but all of you have the calling of evangelism. As a believer, you are called by God. In fact, there's a bema seat that you'll sit before that there is a soul winner's crown that is given to every single person. For every person you've won to the Lord, there is a jewel on your crown. I plan on having one of the largest crowns. God, let that crown be so big because I can't imagine one person going to hell. The crown doesn't motivate me. It's not the crown that makes me go out and makes me look at people and get up this tired body and push everything and give everything I have and pray more and fervently uh, stay at an altar longer and seek the Lord harder. That's not what motivates me as a crown. What motivates me is I'll never forget the lost condition that I was in broken with no hope and no help. 
What motivates me is remembering the six-year-old girl who went to bed hungry. What motivates me, I'm going to get to blatant right here, is remembering the six-year-old girl who was tied up on an ironing board and brutally raped by four adults. Brutally raped with no mother, no father around. What motivates me is the multitudes of times I wanted to take my life because it seemed so hopeless and helpless and there was no way out. What motivates me to move is remember that lost feeling that I had to move every single time, 14 times in my life, growing up out of 12 years of school. And I remember that little girl that just wanted love and acceptance and a daddy. What motivates me and moves me is when I was a little girl and I'd go look in a mall or somewhere and just hope that I would see my daddy because I wanted to believe that he really didn't die. That I never, ever, ever forget that person. How lost, how hopeless, how helpless, what it felt like. God help us with all our church pompous. God help us with all our filling of the Holy Spirit and gifts and baptism and everything else that we continue to play church while there are people that are dying and going to hell and being abused and raped and going to bed hungry and killing themselves on a daily basis, on a moment basis, and they're all in your world. And we keep driving by the church to get to the church. Look at us. Aren't we great? And we create this culture. It's got to be nauseating to God. Because if you don't drag a homeless people in here or drug addict or lesbian or whatever you can drag in next week, what are we doing? What are we doing? If you don't go into your job and look at the people next to you and know that they probably, if they die tomorrow, will go to hell. For all of you raised so great and in church all your life, maybe you don't understand, but I think you do because you were still a sinner. You were still lost. Don't ever forget that moment that Christ came to you. Don't ever forget how powerless and how helpless and how hopeless you were before you met Jesus face to face. And don't ever think that this world has a solution or an answer because it doesn't. You can go to that well day after day and you're going to come back thirsty. You can go through husband after husband and you're going to come back thirsty. You can acquire millions and billions and you're going to come back thirsty. Because none of that has the ability to satisfy the hole in a heart and the longing of a soul that can only be completed when you come back to who you really are, which is a child of the living God. And some of you, hell has fought so bad and hounded so hard because you have the greatest potential to do the most damage to the devil because of what you've gone through. The very ones that think they aren't ministry material and God couldn't use you, you're the very one that God's saying, step up, girl. Step up, sir, because I've got an assignment for you. Evangelism is preaching the gospel to the lost that they might be saved. Revival awakens the saved from a state of spiritual slumber. You see, what revival is, is when God sends revival, then it wakes the church up. And when the church wakes up, they get hungry for souls. You see, God will send you a personal revival that everybody else will be going through the motions, but you'll be preaching like a wild woman and talking to people that they can't even understand because something's happening in you. You start crying over souls again. It's not about your business. God only gave you that business for one purpose. It's not about that job. You had that job for a purpose. You're a kingdom person. You carry an assignment, and that is at all cost, win the lost. Because at the end, that's all that matters. Not your house, not your car, not your job, not your title. In the end, all that matters. 
Do you know Jesus? Are you saved? You're going to go to that same grave or be cremated, and it's all going to be the same ashes to ashes, dust to dust. That pretty pink isn't going to go with you, Phyllis. That watch doesn't matter. The driving force of God has always been the same, for God so loved the world that he gave. His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You know you're in revival when that same driving force is hitting you. That all you care about is when you look at a person, do you know Jesus? You don't necessarily say it that way, and I'll teach you how to do that in the next few moments. But all you care about, day after day, is are they saved? God, send us revival. Pour out your spirit upon all flesh. Let every heart hunger in this house. Wake them up in the middle of the night. Visit them in whatever type of visitation you have to have until our hearts and our souls become so stirred with what your heart is stirred with, oh God. John chapter four, verse 35 and 36 says, say ye not that there are four months. And then come as harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes. Now there's the challenge. Because the fields are not pretty. The fields are not easy. And when you really lift up your eyes and you look on the harvest field, when you really look on the harvest field, it's an ugly field. It's a difficult field. It's an antagonistic field. But when you really look on the field and you see the field, the hopelessness of people's condition without a relationship with God, you cannot turn a blinded eye and go back to your normal life. You just can't. When you really look up and he says, stop thinking the harvest is four months away. I'm telling you, lift up your eyes because there's harvest all around you. And look on the fields, they're white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. Only the people that reap receive wages and gather fruit unto life eternal. All the other fruit in your life doesn't matter. I hate to burst your bubble. Enjoy it, but it really should just be purposeful for your assignments and what you're doing in this earth. I believe that we are on the precipice of one of the greatest harvests, Habakkuk chapter 2, 14, that for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord and the waters as the waters cover the sea. So we talked about three things that happen at revival. Compassion. Remember that? It's our shame that the devil desires souls more than the church does. Prayer, that nothing comes to pass without prayer. It brings the will of God. And then the proclamation of the anointed word. And that we talked about how the word, we talked about and we landed last week, how the word is coming back, how we had victory in Louisiana. We had victory in Oklahoma and they're just little tiny blades of grass. But literally we're seeing a restoration and it's a big sign to those who are believers. Because when God begins to restore his word, the only time you see the glory of God always in there is where there was a restoration of the word. And then there brought a restoration of worship, a restoration of the word, and a restoration of God's temple. God always works the same. So the Bible declares in Psalm 33, 4, for the word of the Lord is right. And all his works is done in truth. For revival, it is a message anointed with more than just insight or edification. And this is so important. I'll never forget being with one of the most prolific preachers in our generation. It was at Without Walls, and I'd brought in all my students. I wish I hadn't now. And this person, if I said their name, every single person in here would know them. I brought in all my PITs, pastors in training, and MITs, ministers in training. And I thought, no one knows hermeneutics and homiletics better than this person. And they begin to, to open up and tell them, they said, this is, if you're going to be successful, 
God help us. God help us. No wonder the church is in the condition it's in. Because I surely didn't know any of this in the, the height of success of Paula White. And thank God I didn't. He said, if you're going to be successful, if you're going to have an effective ministry, then you're going to have to learn how to preach psychological to people. And they started breaking it down. And if I start pointing out preachers, I will tell you right now. And if I show you, what does that mean? You're preaching to the emotional state, to the psyche of a person, not to their spirit. And 90% of ministers in the pulpit do it today. And the Bible says nothing. In fact, he says, I don't even care about your thoughts because my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Harvard's already messed up your head. <laughs> you, 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 your, your thoughts are, we start messing that up with ideologies and indoctrination by the time you're in, in K, K whatever it is right now. What are they in? Not even kindergarten. By the time you get out of your mother's womb, they're, they're indoctrinating you now probably before you leave the hospital. Thank God I didn't understand any of that because all I knew was how to take the Word of God and preach the Word of God. And the only thing that works is the Word of God, which is right and true, which is unfallible, which is life, which brings forth transformation. In fact, Paul says, and the Bible goes through, that all the intelligence of man is nothing. Paul said, I count all my education, all my intelligence, and he was very intelligent, as dumb. That every accomplishment I ever had, it was just poop is what he was saying. It's just crap. It was absolutely nothing. What is in me is the power of God. What is in me is the spirit of God. It, it, it is God breathing in you and through you, anointing your words. It's not the eloquency of man's speech or your ability to talk to somebody's psyche or intellect. God help us. It's not psychological. It's not life coaching. I remember when Paula White was soaring at the top, they, they all the, the secular institutions, William Moore signed me up. I was incubating for Steve Harvey. I was life coaching on Tyra Banks. You guys remember the days doing all this. And, and they wanted me because you can't hit the issues hard. You can't come out and say, this is sin. And this is righteous. And I was uncomfortable, Rachel, because they wanted me to life coach. And I'm like, I, I don't know how to slide into that mantle. And thank God it didn't last long. And thank God the enemy didn't get me. <laughs> I'm being serious. Because I don't know how to do anything but say right is right if no one's doing it. And wrong is wrong if everyone's doing it. They, they don't want me to say, I couldn't say. There is a real hell. And it's not just something mentally to you. It is a physical place that if you die without Jesus Christ, you will spend an eternity separated from God. It is a reality. Now, people don't even preach on hell anymore. You don't, the gospel is good news. And the good news is that you are a sinner. That's good news. The reality that you come to face to face with your, your wickedness and your, your illness and your, your inability to save yourself. That, that as long as we keep telling people how great they are and how good you are, and we raise kids from the time they're one and two and you're so special and there's nobody like you. And, and, and we wonder why we have the highest suicide rate because the reality is something deeper says, I've got a problem because I'm lying to my mom and daddy. I've got a problem because I just want to hit kids. I've got a problem and everyone has the same problem that's going to manifest in a different way. It's called sin. It's a separation and a missing of the mark of God. And all of us are sinners. And the wages of sin is death. And until you have that face-to-face -face encounter that mom can't help me, dad can't help me, preacher can't help me, grandmama can't help me, that nobody can help me but Jesus, it will put you on the right path to truth and the right truth and the right path is there's only one way and his name is Jesus Christ.
Christ and he's savior, he's Lord, he's redeemer, he's deliverer, he brings you out. He's the only one that can rescue you. And it is the truth of God's word that penetrates through an old country preacher or through a messed up Mississippi girl or right through your lips or right through your heart to someone. It's not condemning them as we'll see in Mark chapter four, but it's having authenticity and it's being intentional and it's being truthful. Woman, you've got a problem. You're always going to be thirsty because you've got a generational thing in your life, a cyclical thing that makes you keep going back to the same issue. And your issue happens to be men. Your issue happens to be husbands. And you have a cyclical issue that is not solving your problem because your problem cannot be solved by natural means. Your problem cannot be solved because it's a spiritual problem. And the spiritual problem cannot be solved by a natural solution. So the the only way it can get resolved is God's way. It's just to receive his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ will deliver you and save you. Somebody better look at your neighbor, say there's only one way. There's only one way. So the message that brings worldwide awakening is that which embodies what God's doing and proclaims what God's saying. Revival not only brings souls to Christ, but also brings the next phase of God's progression, renewal, restoration to the church. I feel like just teaching a little bit. Can you stay with me for 15 to 20 minutes? Thank you, Pastor Rachel. So it's important because when, when it's brought by an anointed scriptural truth into a generation, it changes. Here's this wild man, John the Baptist. He ate locusts and honey. He, he wore this weird little linen gird. He's strange. John the Baptist stirred the nation of Israel, and historians will tell us that between 750,000 and a million people were baptized through his ministry. What was the origin of this move and this kind of anointing? Luke chapter 7, verse 32, the word of God came to John. Now that's important because God's no respecter of persons. The word of the Lord came to Livia. The word of the Lord came to Tamron. The word of the Lord came to Amy. The word of the Lord came to Steve. You see, God will always put a word in you and a word on you for your situation. It might be out in the wilderness and people start gathering. It might be in your company and people start gathering. The word of the Lord, I, I'll never forget, I went to this, um, the, the CEO of a very large music company. And everybody told me nobody can ever even get in. This is back in the like, maybe 2005 or so. They can't get in. And this is a very important meeting. I can't believe you're getting in his presence. I look back at pictures of people that I was with and I was like, that's insane I was with them. I mean, it's just God just put me in place after place. And, and they were like, are you prepared, Paula? Now they meant, do I know how to talk to a music executive? Absolutely not. I know very little when it comes to natural things. <laughs> And that has never gotten me any kind of promotion. Now, don't tell the rest of the world. Please don't tell them. But that, that has never been what has moved and opened a door. And so I go and they said, they're going to talk about this. They're going to talk about this and blah, blah, blah. And it was crazy because they were off. I'm not musical at all. You guys know that. I don't know how to sing. I don't know how to carry a beat. I don't even know how many notes. And I'm married to the greatest musician in the world. So I, I know nothing with this. And I was being offered um, a, a contract from this recording, one of the largest even to today, which is insanity. And they're like, you, you need to be really be prepared. This is an opportunity. Nobody's ever had this. So I walk in. I look in his eyes. And they expect me to sit down, and they're all around me, and they, you know, nobody gets in this room. And I look in his eyes. I said, sir. I said, the Spirit of God says to you, and by the way, he's Jewish. I said, the Spirit of God says to you right now. And I begin to give him the word of the Lord, and he starts to choke up. They're all nervous, because they, they are like, they will, you know, that'll be the end of their career. And I didn't have any, anything to give him but one thing. A word of knowledge came on me at that moment that got his attention. And it was the very thing that that man cared about the deepest in his life, but had no resolution. I told him what to do, how to do it. And quite honestly, 
I prayed salvation over him. I just talked to him. I told him about Jesus. And not that I was trying to proselyte or go win all of Israel over, but the Lord told me to speak the word of the Lord over him. And I did. And everything transformed. What did I have that day? How to be a CEO? How to negotiate record contracts? Did I, did I, have it? I had none of that. At the word, thank you, Jonathan, the word of the Lord. What I'm telling you is you don't have to preach 10 sermons. You just have to be full of God's presence and God will give you the word of the Lord in your environment, in your situation. At that moment, all I've ever had in any way is the word of the Lord. And we're complicating this thing so much. Like you've got to memorize from Genesis all the way to Revelation. The word of the Lord is a relationship with the Holy Spirit and a yieldedness of you that you just say, God, speak through me because you do nothing in this earth unless you partner with someone. And you want to reach this man. You want to show him that you're real. And so God brings that word. So what happened? He was the origin of the move, but it was the word that came to him. This is a commission of God to declare his word with power and authority from John. John chapter 1 verse 6. He was a voice of one crying in the wilderness. The one crying in the wilderness was the Spirit of God. John was the voice. You aren't hearing what I'm saying. The one crying in the wilderness was the Spirit of God. The one moved here today is not Paula. Don't don't mistake that. It's the Spirit of God moving in me. I felt that yearning. I felt that crying. I felt that heaviness. I felt that, that God burden on me. I felt that this morning that I couldn't barely stand in the back. I'm like, I just need time to get my thoughts. I need time to do this because I've been heavy under there. It's not Paula was heavy. Paula was crying. The one doing that is the Spirit of God. I'm just the voice. I'm just the voice to communicate it. I'm just the voice. Whatever setting you're in, you're just the voice. I'm just looking for somebody who'll say, yes, God, I'll be the voice in Publix. I'll be the voice in my neighborhood. Come on. I'll be the voice on my job site. I'll be the voice in my school. I'll be the voice in the home that I live in. You're the, you're just the voice. Same thing on, uh, when 3,000 got saved on the day of Pentecost. Peter was just the voice. The same guy that denied Christ is now saying that the Christ that you crucified and 3,000 people come to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to go over a couple of things that Jesus handed us a great commission as he was going to sit down at the right hand of the Father. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. He said to them, go into, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Ultimately, everything we do for Jesus is evangelism. The winning or the revival of personal commitments to Christ. I just want you to get that down today. I want it to be so deep in you that every day you are soul conscious. Every day you look at people and you don't see them the same. I want conviction to come upon you today. I want the heart of God to be imparted to you today. In John 4, 4, I must needs go. Can one person really make a difference? Because when God wants to change a nation, he changes a person. For some, you'll be the only Bible that has ever been read by people. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, which means evidence. So I'm going to give you three things and then I'm going to preach for five minutes. I'm just going to give you three things and I'm going to preach for five minutes and there's going to be a mighty move of God. Testimony means evidence. Your life is evidence. I I could probably, and just because I, I love to consume the word of God, And I don't consume the Word of God because I'm a pastor or because I have a job to do. I consume the Word of God because it's my very lifeline. It's the essence. I can't live without it. It's like living without food. It's like being without. I don't consume it for other people. I consume it for me. Because deep within me, there's always that, that part of me that never forgets and that's just a little bit afraid, which is a good thing, that while most of my life has gone to the right, there's always that little part of me that is that scared little girl, still traumatized, still scared that what it was like to be before I got saved. That's not an unhealthy thing. I've gone through a lot of deliverance. I've gone through a lot of counseling. Work on uh, getting the trauma out of my nervous system. 
but there's a little bit of that always left that's kind of healthy. That I'm not so far removed that I forget what it felt like. That I forget who I was. And that's important because I, I get in the word not to do something for other people. I get in the word for me. Is it important what I'm saying to you? And so I could probably go from Genesis to Revelation and quote something almost out of every chapter. And, and not, not for people. <laughs> I told you this before, I was afraid. And fear is not always a bad motivator. It's one of the greatest motivators. I was afraid that I would live in a generation, and it's very possible still, that the word would be taken from us that I wouldn't know it. So I, I hid it in my heart. I would sit there, I still do. I write down scriptures over and over and over till I'd memorize them. I'd get them so deep in me. I had stuff to live by. And even though my mind forgets some of them because I'm not rehearsing those, when I get in a place that they're needed, the Holy Spirit brings it up and uses it. Is vitally important because he said that they'll be made overcomer by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, the evidence. So, so it's, it's the importance of the word in you is that it's changing you. It's not just so you will know it to use it. It's changing you. How do I keep going with this? Help me, Holy Spirit. The word is what washes your soul. The Word is a mirror. Everything else is going to lie to you. I don't care if you watch CNN or Fox, they're going to lie to you. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, it's going to lie to you. A preacher or a pastor is going to lie because it's not capable of total truth. The Word is a mirror. So when you get in the Word, it gives you an accurate reflection, a real condition of who you are, what you can do. And it's not just to pump me up. You can't mix this with all your motivational. You can't mix this with all your life coaching. You can't mix this with your new age stuff. You've got to take the unadulterated word that convicts you, that cuts you, that molds you, that transforms you. It's not just another book. It is the book. It is the only thing that brings true life to you. And I'm not saying don't read other things. You can read whatever, but don't get it twisted. It is the word of God that is truth. It is the word of God that is flawless. It is the word of God that is right. It is the word of God that is perfect. It is the word of God that when heaven and earth passes away, it will remain forever. It is the word of God that God doesn't separate himself. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's so vitally important that you understand that because the evidence of God in your life of being transformed comes through the word of God changing you, working with the Holy Spirit, God transforming you on a daily basis basis. It's that evidence. Come on. That people will see last year she was this, but she's that this year. They'll look at your flaws and try to take you down, but they'll see the evidence you're still in the game. Come on. You're still standing. You're still victorious. You're still going. And that's because God's word is working on the inside of you. Without the word of God working, there's no growth. There's no, there's no transformation. So, so, so this is important because evidence is important. It's vital important. There are three ways that you bring people to the Lord. Number one is prayer. Galatians 4, 19, my little children of whom I travail and birth again until Christ be formed in you. Number two is lifestyle. People see God in you. Even you're, if you're with an unsaved spouse, the Bible says in 1 Peter 3, it says, wives in the same way, be submissive to your husband so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives that when they see the purity and reverence of your life, do you know what that's saying? That you're living with a Jack Daniel, drinking around, fooling around, rough man. And God speaks to you because you have a choice if he's, if, if he's committed adultery, which I had a situation, you have a choice to stay or leave. If he's unsaved, you have a choice to stay or leave. That's important. You don't always leave and you don't always stay. People come to me and they want to know, what do I do? 
I'm, and you know what I tell them? I'm going to give them the word, but I'm going to say, you're going to make your decision. And you're the only one that's going to live with that decision. I can counsel you through the word. But I can't tell you because sometimes God's going to say, stay in this situation. Oh, he'd never do that. Really, Hosea? You sure about that, Gomer? See, all of us are have different. We all, we're all different. And that's important. What God hates is the abandonment. Divorce is horrible. The breakup of family is horrible. There's nothing good in it. There's also nothing good in you going out and marrying the wrong person. Hear this though, it's important. It says, wives, stay. And you'll convert him, not because your mouth, not because you're nagging, not because your pride or showing how great you are and wanting a badge. You'll convert him by your behavior. You know what God says about a wife that does that? How precious she is? It's her meekness. Now see, I need work in that area. Because I'm kind of like, you fool. I've had, to, I've had to change. I've had to transform. Elder, I mean this sincerely. Like, man, I, I wish there are a lot of things at 58. I look back at one and go, Brokenness hurts. It hurts. And when you've been a part of brokenness and you've either, you, we act like we're always the victim, but you're a contributor to the brokenness. You just look back and you say, God, thank you for your mercy and your grace. And please cover the hearts that I hurt. Cover the past that I broke. Brad's an absolute miracle. He's an absolute miracle. Isn't it easy for me to say, he was an agnostic, he was an atheist, and I was a praying mom. Let me tell you what other kind of mom I was. I was an abandoning mom. How's that feel? I abandoned him to go preach the gospel 300 and something days. I thought I was doing right. I begged my husband at the time, I can't do this, you've got to do this or God will take it away. That was a lie. And an abandoning mom. As a no boundaries mom. What do you mean? I'd gotten so controlled by my ex-husband that I allowed him to be very abusive to Brad. The other part's better, right? That he was a drug addict and an agnostic and I was the praying mom. But the reality is all of us have to take some kind of responsibility for any brokenness that is behind us. Because in some way, we were participants and part of the problem. Oh, I could justify it. But I was 18 years old. I was 19 years old. I was 23 years old. I was in an abusive relationship. I could justify it, but there's no justifying it. You just own up and say, God, please. Heal every place that I had a part in anyone's life of hurting. You know how hard it is as a minister to stand up when you pastor 28,000 people and the church no longer exists? And half of them left the church because you went through a divorce? That's hard. I can justify it. To whom much is given, much is required. I just say, God, find them. Go after them. Heal them. 
You see, we all have to be partakers, not just of the things we've been through, but the things that we've also caused in other people's life. And it could be directly or indirectly. That's a compassion. It's the love of God. I don't know why I got off there, but somebody needed to hear that. 1 Corinthians 9, even though I am free of the demands and expectations, 19 through 27 of everyone, I voluntarily become a servant to any and, and all in order to reach a wide range of people. Religious, non-religious, meticulous moralists, loose living and moralists, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. I did all this because of the message. I just didn't want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. So what are the things that bring them to the Lord? Number one, prayer. Number two, which is your evidence. I could go on and on. And number three, the supernatural power of God. Acts 5.12 And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. John 6.2 And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. As believers, the Bible tells us in Matthew 10.8 Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. So what he's saying to you is people, the supernatural power, signs, wonders, and miracles are not for the believer. They're for the unbeliever. It's all for the unbeliever to bring them to Christ. So what are the three main ways we, we win people to the Lord? Prayer, lifestyle, the evidence of God in your life, and supernatural power of God. How do I lead someone to the Lord? How? You have to go share your faith. You have to share the good news. So we say that. So what's the good news? It always contains three things. Three things. That you're a sinner. That Christ died for us and rose again. And that we alone have to trust Christ to save us. That no one else can save us. So how do I do that? Can I give you a few things? Can I give you a few points, guys? I don't, I'm not giving you these to memorize. I'm giving you something to say. It's not good news. Like we do this so wrong. Like we are like, it's just this simple. You just repeat Romans chapter 10, verse 9, and 8, 9, and 10. And, and there's some truth to that, but not really. Like we make it like you just say that and you walk away. This is a life conversion. It, it is it's something so deep and there's got to be the Holy Spirit bringing conviction to you. It's like when I got saved in that trailer. It was in a trailer. And he looked in my eyes and he told me to do three things. Get a Bible, talk to God, and go find a church. Forty years later, I'm still doing the same thing. Talking to God, reading the Bible, and going to church. They're the fundamentals of my faith. It's so important because it wasn't just like, oh, I made that and then I went back to my life. I went back out and started partying and doing all the things. I didn't even know what that I was doing wrong at the time, but the Holy Spirit was convicting me. And that's important because what are the three things? Prayer, lifestyle, supernatural power of God. So what are the three things that we do to share the good news? You're a sinner. And you don't have to say, you're a sinner. Watch what's going to happen. And I want you to study this. I'm going to preach for the next five minutes after this. But you're a sinner. Does, does Jesus go to the woman at well and say, you're a sinner. You're going to hell. But what does he say? Through a word of knowledge, he says, because he's human. Y'all all act like he's God and this was easy for him. He's human, right? Amen. He's God incarnate. Amen? Yeah. Amen? He gets a word of knowledge and he says, you got five husbands. What's he saying to her there? You're a sinner. He's saying this, what you keep going back to is not the solution of your problem. Watch what he does. He identifies with her thirst. He says, if you drink of me, you'll never thirst again. So let, let me talk to a drug addict right now. If you take of me, 
you'll never go get high again. Let me talk to a workaholic right now. If you walk with me, you'll never go out and spend the rest of your life abandoning your family and everything else for the sake of money. So what he was saying, he identified the need in her life with himself. That's important. Because I'm not saying me, I'm saying Jesus. So I'm saying. I was role-playing Jesus, guys. So, so when, you're, when you're working with someone, be sensitive because you've got to know that every person that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, number one, they're a sinner. I'm going to go, Eli, you're a sinner. I'm going to identify with your thirst. I'm going to go, Eli, how's it going? Not so good. Wife and I are fighting. Mm. And a month later, what are y'all fighting about? And I thought, oh, I used to have these same kind of fights with my ex-wife. Oh, now I just identified a cycle. Jesus said, if you drink of me, I'm the solution to your thirst. He, he brought her the solution. He brought her the problem. You're thirsty and you can't get satisfied. And he, he identified where she was thirsty You've had five husbands. It's cyclical. This is something you can't break, girl. Now, Jesus didn't go in and say, you're a sinner, I'm a savior, and you've got a generational curse. But that's exactly what he did. How do we win people to the Lord? Prayer, lifestyle, and supernatural power. It's all in John chapter 4. You're thirsty. I'm water that will never, you'll never thirst again. You're a sinner. You've got five husbands, and it's a generational curse. You can't break it. Supernatural power of God. All in operation in here. So let's go through, what is it that, how do we scripturally do this? Because it's not memorizing this. I just want you to understand, if you know nothing else, know the gospel. So when I say know the gospel, the gospel is one simple thing. You don't have to know that, hey, when you come out of 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, that you're going to go into a land of milk and honey. You don't have to know that it was an 11-day journey. You don't even have to know. It's beneficial to know all this. You don't even have to know the, the hall of fame of people of faith, that Enoch walked with God and was not. You don't even have to know all that. Now, it's good to know. It's going to benefit you. It's not bad. You don't have to know that, um, I mean, I can just keep going, that 3,000 people got born again at the first church, which is held in an upper room, and they were in the streets of Jerusalem. You don't have to know that there was an Antioch in Ephesus and a Jerusalem church that are patterned. You don't have to know that there were 12 disciples, and one was named Judas and betrayed. You don't have to know that there was a man with palsy that they let down through a roof and Jesus healed him. Those are all great things for you to know. But you don't have to know them. They're really beneficial for you. The more you get in you, the better you're going to be. But the one thing you have to know, the one thing you have to know is that sin entered the world in the garden when Adam and Eve disobeyed. And that all, though created in the image of God, were patterned after the first Adam. Which means we were all born into sin, which makes us all sinners. You have the propensity of sin and you will miss the mark. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of God, of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. What you have to know is that God always had a plan for mankind that he was never going to leave them in that condition. That before the earth was even formed, before the foundation of the earth, the Lamb of God had already been slain. That God had you on his mind before you were ever conceived by your mom and dad. That God had a way out and he was moved and motivated because he loved you, because he knew you before you ever even got in your mother's womb. And that God had this almighty plan that you are not an accident. You are not happenstance. 
that Christ is not just the answer. He is your answer. He's your answer to that sinful state. Hey, woman, do you want a sixth husband and keep the cycle up till it's an eighth husband? Or do you want to break it today? He didn't have to say it like that. He just said, drink of me and you'll never thirst again. So in your way of ministering, what you're telling the person or telling the world is that Christ is the answer, Romans 5, 8. God commended his love towards you that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for us. There's no shame. I love this John chapter four because she's a known adulteress with a respected rabbi and he doesn't bring up her past to condemn her or shame her. He brings it up in order to free her. That God is saying, I know what you've done, I know where you've been and I still want a relationship with you anyway. I know who you are. I know every secret. I know every thought. And I still love you. And I want you desperately. And then John 14, 16. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. And no man can come to me except or to the Father by me. And then you say, you don't have to stay here. There's a way out. Tell me how. And let me tell you how I know she got set free. And how she was transformed. Well, she went to the city and evangelized it. No. It's how you always know. God's working. She dropped her water pots. She made no provision to go back to that stale, contaminated way of living. She dropped her water pots. When people really receive Jesus, they drop their water pots. In other words, they shut the door to the past because they recognize that had nothing for me and this just offered me life and I'm going to go and move in this direction and that's where the church comes in to disciple and teach and to raise up and to train up and to nurture and to grow up and the perfecting of Christ in a person through the fivefold ministry gifts so every good church should have evangelist, prophet, apostle, teacher and pastor because one growing leg won't just do it but then this woman's like okay okay she goes in and what does she do? she goes she tells this woman who one time hid herself from going in public at noon because she didn't want to be around the people that would gossip about her, that would snide her, that would make her feel less. We've all had that in our life. That would ostracize her. She, she now goes and she tells an entire city, I just met a man who told me everything that I'd ever done. She tells everybody, I'm an adulterer. I, I was a no good person. I had this cycle in my life. I was ever with every man. I stole your man. I slept with your man. I did this. I did that, but I just met a man, the man, and he changed me and he transformed me. And that's what the power of God will do. And I'm sure every woman was suspicious and kept their eye on this woman to see what she'd do. Is she going to still come after my man? No. And all of a sudden you'll see that that entire city of Sychar, of Samaria, is completely transformed by the power of God. And what God's, uh, what God's intention was, was to win a city. He had to win this woman. And Jesus wants to know today will you win a woman will you win a man will you just stand up for one can one person make a difference you have a testimony that nobody else does you have a story that nobody else does you have a uniqueness about you that nobody else does no one on this planet has your story nobody has your walk only you will you let God use you this morning will you be compassionate come on will you stand up with authenticity will you be intentional will you be soul conscious will you make a decision I'm going to change this. This church is going to be full. I'm going to see a popka come to know Jesus. My workplace, everywhere I go. Pastor Paula, I'm going to do my five. I'm going to stand between the gap and stand between the dead and living just like Aaron did in Numbers chapter 16 when the plague was hitting the land and he went to the altar and got fire. If you keep going to the altar and get fire, fire will do one of two things. It will either consume you and burn you or it will fuel you and send you. Let the fire fuel you. Let the fire empower you. Come on, go get that fire away so much that you've got to get back to the altar and get the fire and then stand between the dead and the living. You already know it. The difference between these doors and this sanctuary is the difference of death and life. The difference between heaven and hell. And that's the reality. And if you say, Pastor Paula, use me. God, use me. Holy Spirit, empower me. Get down to this altar. If you say, I want to be used by God. Lord, let 
let your let your fire follow me. Lord, let your power follow me. It's really an individual thing that you just come and say, God, do something. I want to stand between the dead and the living. God, I don't have to be the most articulate. I don't have to be intellectual. I don't need to preach. I don't even have to preach. I just have to share. I just have to live. I just have to be sensitive. I just have to obey. But God, use me. Now, Father God, I pray right now for everybody who stood forward. I pray that you would deeply convict them, that you would visit them, send their Holy Spirit, send angels to them, that they would be on fire for God. Let the power of God fall in their life. Let the anointing of God fall upon them. God, this is your army. This is who I was sent to for the last three weeks. This is your army. Use them so mightily. I pray right now that you would give them a holy boldness. I need some ushers that you would give them a holy boldness and use them mightily in the name of Jesus, by the power of God, in the name of Jesus. Pray over people in their seat right now, in the name of Jesus, let the fire of God touch you. In the name of Jesus, let the power of God, in the name of Jesus, that's fire on you, baby. In the name of Jesus, fire, fire, fire. Let her be a great soul winner. Souls, souls, be healed, be healed, sonny. In the assignment. You are dangerous for the kingdom of God. In the name of Jesus, fire, 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 fire. The Lord says it's not either or. It's not either or. Fire, 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 fire. You are deep. You're a deep well. You're a deep well. This is a this is not a good man. This is a God man, Amy. This is a God man that God gave you. But you are a very deep well. And you carry multiple streams within you. There are specific assignments that you will quickly move into. For the Lord has visited you, the Lord has spoke to you, and the Lord will arrange all things. But the Lord says, you don't have to figure it out, for it is already done. Just obey, obey, obey. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, fire. So doors are shutting on purpose for you, for you both. Doors are shutting on purpose for you both. But Father, right now, give me that anointing oil. Anoint Amy's head. So you won't think a thought in the natural anoint her mind, that her mind will be filled with the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, let every thought that is not of the Holy Spirit be broken down. I I just hear the word of the Lord saying you don't have to figure it out. You know how to obey. Just obey. Move like you can move with the wind. It's like moving with the wind. You just move with it, and you know what that is. Don't I'm asking, you've got to get out of your mind. Don't think about all the things. You've got to get out of your mind. Just move. It all comes together. It all. You know how to move. You've built an entire thing for God by knowing how to move. You know how to move. God, just, just like make that flexibility in her life right now. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. The Lord's line done some great things for you, Amy. You and Steve, you're de- is, he's a deep well. In Jesus' name, fire, 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 souls, fire, 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 fire for souls. Bobby, souls, let it burn in you. Let it burn. Let your best days be ahead of you. Let what you've gifted him for. He's a gifted communicator. Lord, let him use his mouth for for the kingdom of God. Strategically begin to line things up. You have such a powerful testimony. And you use it. But God's going to expand you. In the name of Jesus. Souls. 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 Fire. Fire. Souls. Pillar here. Fire! Fire! 
fire. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Souls, let him weep over souls. Let him weep for souls. You're a gatekeeper. I see you in the spirit. You're a gatekeeper for things. A lot of what you do spiritually determines what comes in, what goes out. Wow. Very important he has prayer over him. Souls. Souls. Fire. 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 Souls. 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 Fire of God. Fire of God. Mandarabakashaka. Souls. Fire. don't worry about those things. I just see him lifting burdens off you. Lord, take him back to the purity of the cross. I thank you that this man's a soul winner. He's a good man. Heal his body. Lord, I thank you that you're healing his body right now. I speak long life over him according to Psalm 91. Stir up the gift of God. Let the fire of God hit his body. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Steve, come pray over him. Fire God. Fire God. Souls. 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 Will you pray over this man, Steve? Right here. In Jesus' name. Fire God. God. raise your hand. So in Jesus name, if there's anybody here with their hand raised that wants to recommit one, two, anybody else, if you're around someone with their hand raised, just surround them. You online, just say, Jesus, I give you my heart. I surrender it all. Thank you for dying for me, for cleansing me. I'll never go back to my old life, old cycles, old relationships. Today is a day of deliverance. In Jesus' name, you are saved. You are rededicated. Heaven is rejoicing and you align. We just declare that over your life. Father, touch this couple right now. Thank you they're called. Thank you they're chosen. Thank you the hand of God is on their life. God, as they were here, I saw the angels of the Lord stand by you. I saw things fighting your destiny. And and then I also saw giftings come out of you. We activate every gifting in her life. There will be no hope deferred. All disappointments, we turn it around in prayer. We cover this beautiful couple. Their destiny together will be fulfilled. We block all contention. We secure them now. In the mighty name of Jesus.
children don't worry about the timelines don't worry about how we think things should fit in sometimes God just doesn't and he has a prophetic child for you I see a boy a specific prophetic destiny and when God brings things into fruition don't worry about how it all work out he will provide amen we love you guys in Jesus name If this is your first time, please come meet me over here at the altar. I want to get your information. I want to pray with you. I want to stay connected with you. We want to wish Neil Pinkinson a very happy birthday. Where are you at, Neil? Where are you at? We love you. God bless you. This is your year of victory. This is your portion. You've been a pillar in this house. And we, Brian and I are going to send something to you. We love you. Today is Derek and Shay's anniversary. We love them. That We bless them. Their baby's about to be here in the natural. Um, we have uh, Jasmine's birthdays tomorrow. Rachel Blankenship's on the 13th. Where are all my July babies at? Wave your hand. Y'all come over to take over the world. And I want you guys to pray with um, Paul and Gail. Gail Siegel, she lost her father two weeks ago about two weeks ago. So if you think of Gail, she's grieving right now. I, I didn't realize this until the other, till what, yesterday. So y'all pray for Gail. Would you pray for our sister Gail? We pray for you. We ask God to comfort you, keep you, be at your aid in Jesus' name. Let's say our declaration. Let's put it up on the screen. This is it. Ready? For I know the story I have for you, a life of a hope and a future. Jeremiah 29 11. Be blessed. Amen.